I'm Braden. I'm Dan. Um, the rest of the gang is currently uh, in, you know, apocalypse now. Uh, rain apocalypse. Rain apocalypse. Uh, mudslides, uh, flooding all over BC. You didn't um, sacrifice enough goods. Yes, I think they're both under Atlantis. Um, but we got some space news to interrupt the drudgery that is whatever we're talking about on this case file. Uh, thank goodness for this break. Uh, first off, we have uh, a chunk of satellite almost hit the ISS, requiring an urgent change of orbit. Um, now, this latest piece of debris was from a, a, a defunct Chinese satellite, uh, weather satellite that they blew up with an anti-satellite rocket, and it now has you know thousands of pieces of debris drifting dangerously into the ISS's, uh, you know, kind of orbit. Um, one thing that I found was pretty interesting with this one was that the, like, there's been like 30 or so of these, like, ne like urgent change of orbit, you know, incidents with like three, since the ISS has been up whenever they launched that, and three happened in 2020, uh, you know, and, and more in 2021. So it's like we're starting to see them more frequently. I think this is going to be, uh, you know, status quo until we figure out how to what to do with space debris. Yeah, I mean that they're they're considering ways. I mean, there are a number of companies trying to to figure out how to uh, reduce or at least track the amount of space debris, the increasing amount of space debris that sits in low Earth orbit in places that could possibly, you know, uh, affect you know, habitable living spaces, especially not just the ISS, but the, uh, the Chinese, uh, space station that's going up, uh, later, uh, you know, in the next few years. And you've got plenty of stuff just like shooting through at, you know, tremendous amounts of speeds where you've got like this, like this piece of, uh, like this certain, like this tiny piece of debris. And it doesn't even have to be that big. They're saying like, you know, they could be like a speck of dust and like it just if it's traveling at the same speed or, you know, opposite speed, relative speed as the ISS, like it can it can pock, uh, you know, the uh, the viewing portholes. And like if it's like a piece of marble, like if it's the size of a marble, it could potentially like puncture an entire like pressurized cabin. Well, the, like recently the, the, a, a piece hit the Canadian space arm and punk, punched a hole through that. Um you know, I guess it's like the old quip from King of the Hill where if, you know, in a hurricane, you can put an egg through a brick wall. I Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, to my understanding, it is, it is also a matter of like, like I said, like I mentioned before, like relative speed. So like the, the ISS itself is traveling pretty fast. Like it is it is blazing through um, its orbit. And so if you have other things out there that, you know, that are also traveling at a certain speed, you'd also have to look at the relative speed to the the station itself, even right. though it has, you know, it's built durable. So it's got its own like multi-layered, uh, uh, multi-layering armor on the outside, essentially, uh, to kind of mitigate any kind of damage. But um, you still get these things that and th the fact that it's been up there for so long and they haven't had few things, I mean, is that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... Next up, we have the moon's surface has enough oxygen uh, to keep billions alive for 100,000 years. Uh, this one was interesting to me because, as we all know, there's no you can't breathe on the moon. Uh, but it isn't oxygen in its gaseous form. It's, um, from what I real, read, it's in, the real oxygen. The well, no, mine. the real question is, like, how do you get oxygen from cheese? So, yeah, right? I mean, it's in all those Swiss cheese pox. Um, basically there's oxygen. No, the, the rocks on the moon, um, contain, I guess, solid form of oxygen. So now that we know that, you know, if we can figure out how we could process that and utilize it, perhaps. Well, we know how we can do it. Uh, they do know that you can use a process, you know, you can use essentially electrolysis to, yeah. to break it apart. So that, uh, there is oxygen on the moon, uh, you know, bonded to the minerals that are on the surface of the moon. Uh, you know, that rocky, uh, substance that makes up the moon is known as regolith, but you know, it's bonded to a bunch of different minerals on the surface. And so if you send a electrical current through some of these, you can much like we do with how you produce aluminum, 
now it's aluminum oxide and then you send electrical current that frees I think it's up pronounced the oxygen. aluminium aluminium aluminum <laughs> uh but very similar to that that process is how we would do it so it's not a matter of how to do it it's a matter of how we would get the energy to do it since it's a very energy intensive process and the equipment that you would need to get to, you'd have to fly all that stuff to the moon like just getting it out there to to you know produce it at an industrial scale like that would be the re- that's the real challenge well you know it, maybe once we start to uh, get the space elevator going and start building these things and putting them together in space uh, it might be more feasible to get them to the moon than launching all this equipment from Earth, uh, ex- you know, using tons of energy to get it there. Uh, my, I always know there's a storm coming when my all of my alarms start ch- chirping here. It's red alert. <laughs> yeah, red alert. Canada's on red alert. Uh, next up, a mysterious barrier is keeping cosmic rays out of the galactic center. Um, well, that's where that's where Kang the Conqueror is. Sure. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah. his uh, force field keeping them all out. Um, we don't really know what's at the center of the Milky Way. Um, supermassive black hole, pulsar. Um, you know, it could be a, a, it's a zone of mystery, as this article uh, states. Um, but, you know, maybe with the James Webb and some other things, we're going to start to uh, crack some code on it. What do you think about this article, Dan? Uh, it's pretty neat. It's it- there's a lot of complicated stuff in here about like a lot of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even for me a lot of twenty five dollar words. Yeah, uh, you know, talking about things like you have. Uh, there's a lot of stuff like like you said, we're we're not a hundred percent sure about what's in the galactic core or the, what they refer to as the molecular core of the uh, uh, of the galaxy. But I mean, they do have some kind of idea just based on like the stuff that surrounds it. But it, it's difficult to study because you have so much kind of cosmic dust what's well, so that dense, is in there, man. In there right. like you're, what you're trying to see through right it's like right so you can't study it with the kind of wavelengths uh that we normally send towards uh certain just you know stars and things like this or we, we try to detect coming off of objects or through gaseous clouds or things like that um you know soft x-rays and visible light don't really kind of act the same way and you can't really get a good picture of what's going on visibly so um, so most astronomers expect that the galactic center is a source of cosmic rays. And so cosmic rays are, are basically protons and nuclei that have been stripped of electrons, um, and accelerated to relativist relativistic speeds by powerful magnetic fields. So there are a number of things that it could be near the galactic center that could act as these kinds of galactic ray accelerators. You have things like supernova remnants, pulsar wind nebulae, the supermassive uh, hole at the Milky Way's heart named or Sagittarius A. Um, you have all of these things that can, can, can do that. So you got a team put together by uh, Xiao Wan Huang at the Chinese Academy of Scientists who are looking at gamma radiation in the central, the central molecular cloud of the Milky Way, and they're using that data from, uh, along with data gathered from the Fermi Large Area Telescope, hoping to find the source of these cosmic rays that are coming out of there. Um, so according to their calculations, you have the density of these com- cosmic rays in the central molecular cloud seems to be lower than the density of the cosmic ray C itself. Mm -hmm. And this would suggest that there is some type of barrier that is preventing cosmic rays from penetrating the central molecular cloud. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Now something more our level Uh, for the first time ever. NASA astronauts get to eat space grown chiles on the ISS. Um, So these chili peppers they grew right on the ISS. Uh, mm-hmm. The seeds were brought in June. Um, they grew them. They harvested them. And uh, they made some nice, delicious-looking floating tacos. Yep, space tacos. Right? and um, Tacos in space. It's it's great. And Which brings us right to our next article. Everyone knows if you're eating space chilies, you're going to have a bad time. Poor ISS astronauts will return home in diapers as SpaceX toilet keeps leaking pee. Um, you know, you're having a wild taco night with space chiles, 
and all of a sudden your uh, toilets aren't working. You've got to wear diapers. Uh, sounds like they didn't have any space Pepto with them. <laughs> yeah, that specific article, they actually mentioned the the chilies in there because, like, I think the uh, when they scheduled, the, there were a couple of setbacks to the ske- the first scheduled uh, descent of the uh, or the return of those ISS astronauts, and one of them was due to an undisclosed. Uh, medical condition among one of the crew, <laughs> yeah. so it's like mm, maybe yeah, one of those yeah, yeah. tacos didn't sit. Yeah. Hey, peppers were a little bit too hot, yeah. maybe. Hey, listen, we all know what happens <laughs> when you have Taco Bell, all right? I mean, some of, some of those guys maybe they're just not used to the space spice. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyways, that's space news uh, for this week. We'll be doing space news more often again. Um. We're now back to your regular regular scheduled program of case file. What is it? Two eleven. 12 to 12 um cisco grove ufo enjoy the rest of the show and keep those eyes on the skies to keep up to date with all things alien theorists theorizing follow us across social media on twitter instagram patreon and facebook for updates on new videos and content on youtube Don't forget to click like and subscribe and hit that notifications button to keep those eyes on the skies with alien theorists theorizing.